I hope that you will walk away uh, with an expectation to read the Bible like you haven't had when you first came in here. In other words, you're going you're gonna to feel the force of hope and expectancy when you open the Scriptures. That's my goal. Uh, my goal isn't to um, change you. It's to actually, actually put before you that there's someone and there's something that can and that you come to the Scripture with a high expectation that these are living and active words uh, and you're going to bank everything on it, the rest of your life on it, the rest of your relationship with God on it. You're going to bank your parenting on it. You're going to bank your marriage on it. You're going to bank your finance. You're going to bank everything on this, this reality. Um, why don't we open in prayer? And then I, just so that we all just kind of introduce ourselves. I know we don't have name tags. We might not all remember. But just we're going to be together for six weeks. It would be nice if we just kind of be friends. All right? So let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that... Um, we thank you for your word, and, and <laughs> we do marvel that you have given us your word. <coughs> and uh, the reality, the wonder, the, uh, the richness, the, the breathtaking power and beauty of your word, uh, would you impress upon us? And as Paul prays, would you uh, give us a spirit of wisdom and understanding enlightenment and knowledge of Jesus, and uh, would you move us all forward uh, in a way in which we need to be moved forward in reading and studying your word. Uh, and we do ask, we're going to boldly ask that you'd give us an expectancy, you'd give us uh, hope in coming to your word, and um, that you would surprise us uh, in newer, brighter, bigger, and better ways. And we ask this in your name, A men. Okay, um, so I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Jeff Hatton. Um, yes, and who are you, young man? I'm Wes Edwards. Wes Edwards? Yes, nice to meet you. Glad to meet you. <laughs> Ray? Ray Miles, uh, my wife Julie will be joining us, but she can make it tonight. But she, will she will be here? Okay, we'll just go row by row. Okay. Karen? Karen Kimber. Fantastic. Maybe one thing, like how long have you been in the church? Let's do that. <laughs> Oh, my word. November the 4th. Remember, because you joined me without me knowing. Remember? I did. <laughs> how they get members here, watch out. That's how we do it. <laughs> Wes, how long have you been here? Two years. 2014. 2014? So what is that? Six years now? I guess. Yeah. Who's counting? Uh, pff, not me. <laughs> Ray? I quit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Ray was one of the first people to be a part of this church. And you know what he told me? This is the first conversation. He says, I can't even spell Presbyterian. <laughs> that was our first conversation. I can't even spell it. So what are, who are you? What are you about? <laughs> Basically is what happened. Ruth, yes. we're introducing ourselves. Do you mind introducing yourselves sure, to everybody? I'm Ruth Perini, and I've been here um, five and a half years. It's unbelievable. Five and a half years. Time flies. Sandy. Christmas time 2015. That's four great. Years. Four years. Okay. I'm Margaret Wilson, and I'm not really sure whether it was 2014 or 15 that I started coming, but then uh, I actually joined in <laughs> either 18 or 19, at least I can remember. <laughs> I love it. Something like that. Yeah, no, that's great, Margaret. That's good. Dell. I'm Dell. Yeah. I mean, you were a little tyke. Uh, yeah. You were a little tyke. Yes, oh my word. You were 11, is that what you were when you first came? Yeah. And so you're, you know, your parents moved on to Virginia, right? Yeah. And you were old enough to stay here, go to school. That's why you're here. Yeah. And we just wouldn't let you go. We told your parents, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Christina. Okay. And joined in like fall of 
That's good. Great. Norma. All I know is Jim was here before you, correct? <laughs> yes. Jim actually repaired my broken nose, right? And we began conversations, and then all of a sudden he starts showing up in church, and he's saying, I don't know if I can get my wife and kids here. <laughs> and then Norma showed up, the kids showed up, and I went, whoa, yes, what's happening? That's great. Oh, that's fun. Jason. Yeah, that's great, bud. It's so fun. Marcia. Five months ago. You are like the last one, right? Yeah, the last one we just had in, in the fall. We'll have another one, I guess, in March. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, you were a part of that one night just blitzkrieg. That was insane. We're not, do, we're not doing that anymore. I'm so sorry we did that to you. Yes, you can. We're going to spread it out of four weeks. Yeah, sorry about that. That was, I don't know what I was thinking. I lost my mind on that one. That's all I know. Wow, Julie. That's awesome. Five years. Man. Ten years? She was a baby. That's just, that's crazy land. You know what's crazy is now I'm marrying kids. That's crazy to me. If I start marrying the grandkids, that's when it's over. <laughs> eight months. And you're from Alabama. Sweet home Alabama. That's great. They've not been in the church about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Did you, 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 took the, you took the fast membership, right? Yeah. Are you baptized, brother? Did we baptize you? Yeah. I was, I was uh, baptized in the Episcopal Church. Wow. I've been here 12 years. 12 years. It's hard to believe. Man, that is hard to believe. I remember just trying to get you here forever, and now it's been 12 years. I was stopped in the church for a couple of years. Yeah, that's really cool. I love the last name. And then Bob, your husband. So Bob Elder, is, it's just like, yeah, we need a name tag for that. Yeah. <laughs> Bob the Builder. One and a half years. Ah, that's really cool. Andrea, four months. Wow. Twenty thirteen. And then you just took a little break over in the Highland area. Yeah. Over on the other side of the yeah. pond, right? Yeah. And you're fresh back. Are you glad to be back? I am glad to be back. Good. Yeah. Natalie. That's when that was? That was residency? Yeah, I, I can't imagine remembering a bunch of that. I don't remember a bunch of that. Man, best doctor ever. Trish. Hannah? Hannah Russell. Uh, Church. Yes. And that's right, when y'all came from the, Car is yeah, it Carolina? Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, it is crazy. Wow, yeah, it's so wild when you hear it out loud how long we've all been here. <laughs> Whoa, man. Yeah, but that's so cool, though. I mean, we've done life together for this long. You know what I mean? It's pretty cool. Young man, Abe. Who's that? You had to wait? No. He did a good job. <laughs> You're right. 
Oh, man. That was... Five... Wow. Yeah, and your, your hubby's responsible for a lot of the noises we hear just down the road. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's almost like I can set, I know like sermon prep on Saturday nights, the windows are going to shake, right? And I can look out to the, I don't know which way I'm looking, north or east, and I will see a flash and smoke, and it's kind of fun. After it scared, there was one time though it scared the whole neighborhood. I think, I think, I think Kayworth actually got in his car and thought they were bombing Bush at the ranch. It was so bad. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. I think they had to say, Yes. And every so Nancy's calling me. Are you okay? Do you know what's going on? I think I was at Starbucks on Hewitt, and I'm like, what's that? No, what, what, what are you all freaking out about? That was kind of crazy. Naomi, we're just introducing ourselves, how long we've been here, but you're leaving us, so, but you can still do it. Six years. And then you forsake us. I don't know. You do. You got to go. No, oh, we love you guys. Yeah, and Larry, and then. Yeah. Yeah, GPS used to send everybody that way. They sent over over 84 into that Badger Ranch area, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. There still is now, you know, Redeemer Way. Yeah. Richie. Wow. And then, and then came back. And then, uh, who's next to you? Who, who, who's this person? <laughs> That'd be kind of creepy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so when did you become a Christian? Um, February. Mm-hmm. Coolest thing. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's awesome. Missionary marriage, missionary dating, that's the way to go. You know, that's how Bill Bright, if you guys know Campus Crusade for Christ, that's how they met. It was all missionary. She was, either he or she was not a believer, and one of them pursued the other. Crazy. Dorothy. Wow. Yes. You sent your kids ahead of you. They were here, and what, yeah. On New Road. I think I do remember that. I, no, I didn't hear that one. Oh, I bet the whole airplane met Pete on the airplane. <laughs> or at least heard him. That sounds like Pete. Oh, my word. Yeah, I couldn't help it. <laughs> very good. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Amy. Five and a half years. That's amazing, too. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. 
Yeah. Yeah, your husband and I were texting last night, and he was just making me laugh out loud. So much so that Ty was in the playroom, and he comes down and asks, what's wrong with me? <laughs> if, if you haven't, I know you all know Way, but he has, this dry, he has this dry wit, and he was communicating a conversation to me that he just had with somebody, and it was hysterical. I mean, it was belly laugh out loud, hysterical. I, I loved it. All right, Lise, David, who are y'all? <laughs> Depends. With Pete. Yes. Was, it, Pete's a quiet guy, isn't he, David? Shapers. Yeah. That's awesome. I can, yeah, I mean... One of my favorite weddings is their wedding. The favorite leaving music. What was it? It was, it was Journey. What was it, though? Don't stop, Don't stop Believing. That's how they exited after they got married. It was awesome. Oh, it was so fun. They danced out. It was great. Denton, who are you? <laughs> who are? Well, that's really good. No. You... Ten years. You're the ones that came before your mother-in-law and father-in-law. Just to, I remember Leanne saying, I don't want my mom to come here because everybody will like her more than me. I remember her telling me that. I remember that conversation like I just had it. Yeah. That's so funny. It's great. All right, y'all. Let's do this. We are... We're going to look at how to read the Bible. We're going to look at how to study the Bible. I want to make this as helpful to you as possible. So we are going to have to interact. You're going to have to stop me. You're going to have to ask for clarification. Uh, We are, in order for you to get the most out of this, we've got to do this as a team. Uh, Don't let things go over your head. Don't let concepts just pass you by because in studying the Bible, I'll just give you my, my brief story. My brief story is this. I longed to know how to read the Bible since I became a Christian and didn't know how. So I became a Christian when I was 16 and didn't know how to even approach this thing. No, no idea. I went into, um, well, when I finally got into campus ministry in college, I, the first question I basically was asking those ministers or the campus ministers, how do you study the Bible? And, and nobody could actually tell me how to do it. It was all devotional approaches, right? It was all read and then feel something, you know, grasp something and then move on. I I wanted to know, how do you read this thing? I even went to seminary with that number one thought on my head and in my heart. I want to know, how do you read the Bible? How do you study the Bible? Depending on what class I took, I would get maybe, uh, let's say if studying the Bible is a huge hotel, I'd go to one class and they'd give me a window. I'd go to another class and they'd give me the back door. I'd go to another class and maybe they gave me uh, room 110. Nobody could piece together a comprehensive approach to the Bible. I'd go to the Bible exposition classes and they would exposit the Bible, but they didn't tell me how to study it. I'd go to the original languages and they'd tell me how to do the original exegesis of the text, but then they weren't communicating with the preaching and teaching aspects, so you didn't know how it all tied in. It was an absolutely frustrating endeavor. So I don't know if that's your approach, but if if that's your experience and that's how you feel in approaching the Bible, that it scares you to death to read it and study it, I completely understand. Completely. And I guess it's this obsession that I've had. Uh, I'll never forget sitting in Dr. Hannah's church history. I'm now, I had two classes with him. One's in church history, the other was, uh, at this time I think it was John Owen. And I am just beginning, you could almost say it this way, I had left full-time Christian work exhausted to the roots of my being. I mean, I'm not talking about the Jesus when he says, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few, that you're exhausted because you're doing 
there's so much work to be done and there's so few people doing it and it's that good kind of exhaustion, you know, at the end of the day where you, you put in a hard day's work, you know you put in a hard day's work, you know that there's more to be done, but you've worked, right? No, I'm talking about in the roots of my being, I was exhausted, like done. And I needed to figure this thing out really, really quick or I wasn't going to make it in the Christian life. That's how burned out I was. I had done everything. I had, I, had, um, I had investigated every theology of life change there was in the evangelical world at the time, and I went outside the tradition. I investigated every technique of the Holy Spirit. I went and listened to every Bible teacher and communicator that had an impact in the world. I bought all their stuff, I read all their books, and I tried to master everything they said. I applied every biblical principle that seemed worth applying. I studied everybody that seemed to have the it factor. They just had it, right? I studied them. I tried to figure out what their theology was. I chased down every life change strategy, every spiritual technique, every biblical principle that you can even think of, I chased it down. Tried to apply it to my life. I was exhausted. And then I'm sitting in church history class, and it's a church history class, in this weird, like, eccentric, off the charts, a guy that would put his hand on his head when he would go through church history, he would almost turn into the person that he was talking about in church history, and when he got to Luther, it was really scary. And he started talking about the gospel, and he started talking about the gospel and saying that word, gospel, 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 over and over and over again until I couldn't stand it anymore. And I went up to him after class, and I said, Dr. Han I didn't want to do it in front of everybody and, you know, be obnoxious like I can be. And I went up to him, and I said, you keep talking about the gospel. Gospel, I even said it this way, gospel, gospel, gospel. What do you mean? Are you talking about evangelism? Because I just come across it being on the other side of the world, sharing Christ with college students all over the world, an unreached area. I had been at Harvard. I'd been at Brown. I've done it all to all kinds of college students. I had this moment. I need to give you this flashback. I had this moment when I was in Wilder, New Jersey, and I'm talking to a group, probably about 10 to 15 half-dressed 20-something-year-olds about knowing Jesus. And in the middle of sharing Jesus to them, this obtrusive, invading thought came into my head and my heart, and I couldn't shake it. It was, yeah, Jeff, why do you need Jesus? You're a Christian. Why do you need him? And, and I brushed it aside, finished the evangelistic conversation. I bet, yeah, I know like three or four folks trusted Christ according to this particular way. And I am walking home, and I can't get that out of my head and my heart. Why do I need Jesus? As a Christian, why do I need him? I know why, you know, as a non-Christian, I need him. You know, take care of my sins, get me into heaven. As a Christian, why do I need him? And that pushed me on this, I've got to figure out. And I couldn't come up with anything other than he did something for me in the past, but I don't know what he does for me in the present. And so Dr. Hannah starts talking about the gospel and he starts talking about Jesus as if he matters to a Christian and even to pastors. And so I asked him again, I said, what in the world are you talking about? And he looked at me. I mean, the way he does, he looked at me and I asked the question, right? I told you I asked the question and he turned around and said, it was unbelievable. And you've heard this before, but I want you to hear it in its full light. <laughs> he said, Jeff, do you know what my philosophy of teaching is? And I'm like, oh my. I mean, I'm literally going, oh, my Lord, I just asked you a question. Okay, what's your philosophy of teaching, Dr. Hannah? If you throw a brick into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one you hit. Are you calling me a dog? I mean, this is the way our conversation was going. We were off to a great start, right? Are you calling me a dog? And so began a gospel revolution that I can't quite shake. Because what he ended up doing is he ended up talking about the gospel and talking about Jesus and his salvation in such a way, I can't even explain it, but the grammar of the gospel, he's talking about the grammar and the literature of the gospel, the wonders of the gospel, those exhausted roots were somehow being hit. It was the weirdest thing. It was all of a sudden, 
those deep places that I could not touch, I could not figure out, I could not heal, when I was hearing the gospel, I started getting touched and reached and healed in those places. So what happened at that point, this hunger to know the Bible became an obsession. I want to know how you read the Bible in light of Jesus, the gospel. So what we're going to do in our time together is that by the end of our time together, that's what you should get down. You should get down that the goal of what we're about to do is to experience Jesus with the Bible. There's a theological category that some of you might remember. It's an, it's an ancient one. It came in the Reformation. And that is that Word and Spirit are inseparable. They go together. So if you want more of the Holy Spirit, you've got to get more of the Word. Which is radical. Because again, I've investigated every, every technique of the Holy Spirit, every movement of the Holy Spirit. I took a class from Dr. Hannah on the movements of the Holy Spirit, a complete history in the history of the church. I'm telling you, I was obsessed. What happens today is we separate the Word from the Spirit, and we wonder why we're all out of whack. And we attach the Word to the church. I'm not picking on... I'm picking on everybody, so I don't really care. If you separate the Spirit from the Word and you attach it to the church, it's called Roman Catholicism. If you separate the Spirit from the Word and you attach it to an anointed individual, special anointed individuals, it's called uh, charismatic or Pentecostalism, uh, or uh, TV preachers and things of that sort. If you separate the Spirit from the Word and attach it to, let's say, the human heart, a direct encounter with the human heart. Uh, th historically, oh God, human heart. Historically, it's called Anabaptism. Uh, but that has led to pretty much most of, of um, a lot of evangelicalism today. We always talk about Jesus in the heart, right? It's the spirit is connected to the heart. That's how things work, as opposed to spirit connected to the word. I think the one I've made up, and it's, it's what I grew up in my tradition, is the spirit attached to biblical principles. <coughs> Timeless truths. The Spirit is attached to the Word, and because the Spirit is attached to the Word, the goal here, everybody wants to experience Jesus. Some people are trying to experience Jesus through the church and its traditions. Some people are trying to experience Jesus through anointed individuals. Some people are trying to experience Jesus directly in the human heart. Some people are trying to experience Jesus through biblical principles and how-tos and timeless truths and yada, yada, yada. We, our goal is to experience Jesus with the Bible. Okay? That's why I want us to have a growing expectancy to approach the Bible for that. And I would add a qualifier, experience Jesus. And it's a big qualifier, but it doesn't, it's, when you get, start saying all these qualifiers, it's not as catchy. It's not as memorable. By faith. <laughs> all right, so if I was just to add something into experience Jesus with the Bible, I'd say experience Jesus by faith with the Bible. All right? Okay, so let's talk about this way. Um, I would like to hear from you. You can, you can answer it this way. Well, let's do it this way. I wrote a couple questions down here to get us started. Uh, when I read or study the Bible, I feel, at this point, where you're at, when I read or study the Bible, I feel blank. How would you fill that in? If you don't like that one, how about this? Uh, what... Um, what do you hope to get out of our time together? What excites you about the Bible? So pick whatever one you want to pick. What excites you about learning how to read and study the Bible? What challenges you or what makes you uncomfortable or what barriers are there to reading and studying the Bible for you? So, when I read or study the Bible, I feel fill in the blank. Um, what do you hope to get out of the time together? What breakthroughs would you like to see happen in the way that you read or study the Bible? 
Uh, what have been barriers? What excites you? Take a pick. A couple of you, be vulnerable. Shoot it out. Dave, you're always willing to say something. Come on. Which one do you hear? Which one do you want to respond to? Yeah. Sure. That's all that's out there. And and then I also uh, I get pretty excited when uh, when when God's doing really inscrutable things, you know, stuff that's hard to understand. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and I and I just wind up collapsing on you know the you know we're not it's God or, or you know we're to do what's right. Yeah. So when you approach the scripture, if I was to say, fill in the blank, when I read or study the Bible, I feel, you feel what? Um, Maybe generally speaking or right now, if you want to pick one. I'd say I, I feel uh, ungrateful. Okay. Like I've, I've got something amazing in my hands and, and I tend to not regard it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Reminding me. Yeah. And then I go, where's that? That's interesting. That's good. Anybody else? Sandy, were you saying something? I would say what I hope to get out of this class is something that goes back to, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago and not in this church, but when there's some kind of issue or whatever we're grappling with yeah, yeah. in life and it's a hard decision has to be made. And friends would encourage me with, well, just be in the Word. And I think, yeah, that's good advice. But then I'm thinking, but where? Which part? How do I know if I'm doing it right? Um, because it's not going to say, turn down Liberty Road and then take, I mean, you know. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, how does that work? Yeah. How do you even approach that? Right. No, I, I feel, I, I heard that. Right. I heard that in my parachurch experience all the time. I'm like, okay, yeah, seriously, and can so you tell me how? I yeah. feel a lot of times like when I'm doing Bible study, it is, here's a nice uh, section that I'm studying now. And right. I'm learning these characteristics and these aspects of God, these yep. characteristics of God, through these stories, and I think, okay, is this has got to be incomplete, Yep. because it's, you know, we just finished a study in Genesis, that yep. was a great study, but, yep. okay. Okay, Genesis yeah, is done. Go yeah, good. Excellent. Anybody else? Yes, Christina. Um, I'm hoping to get a new life of studying Hmm. Hmm. And, um, quiet times and stuff was something that the Christians did. Sure. And they didn't have one. We were never Christians. Yeah. And so for me, that felt like a new barrier of, well, I can't do it all the time. And so, well, I guess I'm not going to do it all. Like, not going to take a break and not do it all. That's so, so interesting. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. Um, so. Quiet times. That's a. Interesting. Thank you. How about one more? Larry? When I read the Bible on my own, yeah. <laughs> Karen likes that. She says. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, man, thank you. Karen, you're resonating with that? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah. And even questions like why is there this many things in Christ that we're all expected? Mm. Okay. All right. Blake. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Yeah, no, that's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. So one of the things, again, I wanted to mention that our whole approach to the Bible, I want it for all of us to have that change just a little bit so that there's an expectancy, there's a hope in approaching the scriptures. Um, I'm going to lay out what we're going to do in these upcoming weeks, just real simple so you can kind of, if you're like me, I want to know what are we doing. Um, and then we're going to wrap up by, I'm going I'm to give you um, hopefully an image that you're just going to see it get filled in and get filled in and get filled in and hopefully it'll be helpful. So the first thing that we're going to do is, is what Luther says uh, when you approach the Bible. Shut up and listen. So we're going to call it round one when we come to a text. Is listen to the text. Uh, we'll explain all of this next week or most of it next week. Round two. You're going to understand the text. So notice that analysis comes second, science comes second, art comes first, okay? Uh, we are going to learn to become an intelligent mystic. In other words, we're going to learn to experience Jesus with the Bible, that's an intelligent mystic. We're going to have no false dichotomies between truth and and experience. The Bible doesn't even know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> the Bible has no concept of dividing these two because truth is reality. <laughs> it's reality. You experience reality. That's just the way it is. It's not this floating thing that you grasp and you're like, oh, I got something. No, when you know the truth, you just entered into reality. You just like had your eyes opened and now you see, oh my word, this is, 
this is reality, right? So we're going to grow in being real people. We're going to grow in being intelligent mystics. Uh, round three, what we're going to do is we're going to discover the text's oops, message. And you're gonna, we're going to figure out what that means. There's a lot obviously packed into that. Round four, we're going to discover, can I just do this? Discover what we're going to call the gospel arc. Another way we're going to say it is we're going to discover the textual Jesus. Okay? So we're going to do that. It doesn't matter what you pick your text. Proverbs, same thing. Genesis, same thing. Leviticus, same thing. Revelation, same thing. John 19, same thing. Okay? Round five is for communicators, but it's going to be good for all of us. Is we're going to uh, discover, I'm just going to do the same thing, discover the sermon message or the teaching message. Okay? That's all, that, so he rounds out studying the text. So if you're um, wanting to get to the essence of how to communicate what you're learning, just put this is the communication aspect of what you're learning. So, for instance, if you want to uh, do something with your children or something with your uh, uh, family worship, if you want to lead a Sunday school, if you want to whatever, that this particular point would be for anyone that wants to be a communicator. And I'm going to treat all of us as communicators because we're all communicators, and you can take what you want from it depending on where you are in the communicating gifts, okay? But we're all communicators, all right? And that's how we'll round out our time together. So t right now, today, here's what I'd like to do. I think I've just been walking off camera for a little bit. Let's talk about listening to the text, or let's just let's look at what we'll call the gospel art for a second. And I'm going to hand out stuff to you. For those that want that kind of stuff, great. For others that don't, doesn't, don't worry about it. Here's what we're going to do no matter what text we're at. We are going to, uh, we're going to have what's called poll one and poll two. This is what's called the gospel arc. So, poll one is going to be whatever text you're studying. So, you land in Proverbs, you land in Genesis, you land in John, you land in Ephesians. That's the text you're looking at. What you're going to be doing here is you're going to uh, you're going to discover the original meaning. Okay, so you're going after original meaning. Proverbs, you're going to get the original meaning of Proverbs five twenty two through thirty four. What's the original meaning? Pull one. Here is the presupposition, here's the basis for this. We're arguing, we're going to argue that pole one and pole two are inherently connected. They are together no matter what. Because pole one is, is um, Harry Potter book one. Pole two is all seven books. Now, in poll one, you're told about a horcrux. You have no clue what a horcrux is in poll one. But you're told about it. It's there. But the meaning that you have to make understand what a horcrux is in book one means absolutely nothing. By the time you get to the end of the book, oh my word, you now can read... You now can look through the lens of pole two back at pole one and it explodes with meaning. What's the classic movie? The Sixth Sense. M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense. Remember? McColkey or whatever that boy's name is. I can't remember his name. Remember when he first meets Bruce Willis, who's the cop? He says to him, I have a problem. I see dead people. Fantastic. I see dead people. 
It is, it is true what he just said in that original context. He sees dead people. And it had meaning to the cop when he says that. He's like, oh, wow, we've got to figure that one out. You've got some special gift, right? And then you watch the whole movie and you can't figure out all the things. There's just these, these impossible things going on. That you're just like, that is so weird. What's wrong with their marriage? And you can't figure out all. There's so many gaps. There's so many. There's truth being told, but it's just not filled out. It's, it, you can't figure out what's wrong. And then you realize at the end, Bruce Willis is dead. Sorry. And now you have to rewatch the whole movie, right? And now all of a sudden, Bruce is dead, has just become ultimate revelation. And you look through that lens, and now you rewatch that whole movie. What the Bible does is the Bible is unfolding its story, and it's unfolding it like any good story. And it's giving you true things. I see dead people. It means something in that context. He sees dead people. It has a, it has a, a meaning, a contained meaning in that original slot or scene. But when you get to the final and full revelation of Jesus, who is the Word of God, now all of a sudden it maps more meaning onto what was just said earlier. If this is a skeleton, if this is, in, if this is true, but not exhaustive, meaning what Moses understood was true, but it wasn't exhaustive. David comes along and he understands more truth, but not exhaustive. And all of a sudden, it gets exhausted at Jesus. And so what we're going to learn to do in those five rounds that I talked about, you're going to learn and I'm going to learn, we're going to learn to read forward And we're going to learn to read backwards. And in reading forward and reading backwards, we're going to get the textual Jesus. You're going to experience Jesus with the Bible by reading forward and reading backward. In those five rounds, we're going to lay out how to do that. It's not as complicated as this might sound you're actually going to be like, oh my word, I can do this. Okay? Um, at poll one, you're going to find what are called gospel threads. And you're going you're gonna to grab a gospel thread and you're going to follow that thread till it finds its complete fulfillment in Jesus and his salvation. And what you just did is you got a textual Jesus. Most, most approaches where Christocentric teaching and Christocentric reading the Bible get a bad rap is that it always like, oh, oh here he comes. They're going to wrap up the story with Jesus. Right? So you say a, you do the original meaning. You say a bunch of things that are true, and then you tack Jesus on the end. And that's how a lot of it goes. It's called leapfrogging. You leap over the text to get to Jesus. We are going to get Jesus in the text, a textual Jesus. He's not going to float above the text because if he floats above the text, he's always going to float above your life. There's no texture to him. There's no power to him because he's not coming from the text. Because every text has a specific aspect of Jesus and his salvation. Every text does. The gospel's a diamond Every text is just turning that diamond and giving you one breathtaking cut after another, and it's infinite because his glories are infinite. And one sliver of splendor will justify you and sanctify you and eventually glorify you. And every passage of the Bible contains a sliver of splendor. Embedded in Israel's history is a historical and theological connection to Jesus, period. Or it doesn't make sense. Why have it? Seriously, who cares about Israel's history? So when Jesus, I'm giving you everything here. I didn't even know what I was going to do tonight. I guess I'm rolling. 
Um, Jesus shows up to two, this is right after the resurrection, two people have quit. The disciples, they've hung it up, man. They're burned out completely. Their founder and hero just got slaughtered. The supposed strong one, Peter, ran like a little girl or a little boy. I don't want to be one way or the other. The little person, right, ran. Uh, everything's gone, and they're walking. They're seven miles outside Jerusalem. They're walking. They've quit. It's over. And Jesus shows up, right? And he asks them what they're talking about. And they look at him like you would if you were them. They look at him like, who in the world? Where, what? You know, are you, and what did they say? Are you, the only, are you the only dude on the planet that doesn't know what just happened in Jerusalem? Seriously, did you just come out of like, you know, some insane asylum? What's the deal? And he goes, no, what things? What things happened? And they tell him. And then in the midst of it, he stops now, you're Jesus. You are the resurrected Jesus. You're about ready to ascend and become the glorified Jesus. Right? Like full glory, full on back glory. So how are you going to communicate to these two that don't have a clue what's real? Do you just finally go up to them, Wes, and just finally go pop and like, it's me, you know, it's me, it's me right? It's me. I'm Jesus. I, or do you just do this? Oh, I know how I'm going to show him. I'm going to do a resurrected Jesus miracle. I did a human incarnated Jesus miracles for them. Let's do a resurrected one. What? You know what I mean? He could have done that. He, he, there are many, many approaches that he could have had to, because this is the first encounter with the resurrected Jesus. This is, this is how Jesus is going to reach people for the rest of this age. He's showing it to us right now. What does he do? <laughs> he has a Bible study. He has a Bible study. That's, that's unbelievable to me. And when he has this Bible study, what he ends up doing is he starts rereading everything they already knew putting on the lens of final and full revelation as the resurrected one, as the final and full revelation of God, he puts on his life, his death, his resurrection, and he, he now rereads the Bible to them. And what's the text say? In beginning with, right? It says that he interpreted the Bible. He did exegesis. He told its original meaning in light of him. And what did those two say when they gave their report back to everybody else? When they eventually, they realized it was him as he was, many think, giving the Lord's Supper and the, and the other means of grace. What did they say? They said, did our hearts not burn? When? When he opened the scriptures to us. Not did our hearts not burn <laughs> because we had him? Did our hearts not burn when he opened the scriptures? So, Experiencing Jesus with the Bible seems to be what it's all about. So Jesus is going to reach you. He's going to reach your kids. He's going to reach this world through the Bible. So that should get us to the Bible, right? So you can know when you go to the Bible, at least that God has set it up for you to experience his son. You can go with that expectation. You don't have to, like, pretend it's true. You don't have to, like, work yourself up to hoping that it's true. You can know that when Jesus set the pattern for the church, he's teaching us all now how he's going to break into the world, how he's going to reach people. What he did is he had a Bible study with them. He opened the scriptures to them. So that's what we're going to do for the next five weeks after this week. Brother? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that the way to read the Bible? Yeah. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm asking you to explain why this is important. Why do you want to experience Jesus? 
Well, I mean, I'll go with doctor, another Dr. Hannah-ism. I mean, the dude was just loaded with him. In fact, I realized in our senior year in seminary that people were writing over the years, have been writing his anecdotes. There is like a book about this big. I need to get it. Pete has it, and I need to get it. I could add, tw I could add tons to that book, but it's an it's a enlarged thing. Um, I was taking him to the airport, and um, he was getting out. And many of you do know this story. Some of you do not. And I... You know, anytime I, I helped him put his roof on, uh, he did school the old-fashioned way when he'd do take a, a Jonathan Edwards class. If you did a Jonathan Edwards class or a John Owen class, he'd only limit to, to like 10 students, and then he would do it at his home. And I remember, <laughs> this is what I do, this dude was something else. Pete came in one time, and he goes, hey, man, they're in the middle of a fight. You might want to just be ready when we go in there. He and his wife were in the middle of a fight. And we're about ready to have a class at Jonathan Edwards. And Pete comes out. And he's like, oh, my word, they're in the middle of a fight. What are we supposed to do? I said, let's just go in and listen. So we went in and listened. <laughs> but that's, what, that's the way they were, you know. And I think that's real Christianity. So let's go back to this. He's, I'm driving him to the airport. And uh, he gets out of the car over here. It's right at DFW. He opens the door here, grabs his bag, grabs his suit coat. Starts walking, and I, the window's still, and I go, Dr. Hannah, Dr. Hannah, one more question. He looks at me. I go, what's the secret to the Christian life? Without flinching, man, he comes right up to the window. So the door's down. I'm over here, here's the passenger side. He puts his hands on, he goes, beholding him, and walked off. Do you think I remembered that? Beholding him. And then if you go to Paul, says it this way in, in 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. Uh, we who behold, main verb, we who behold him, main verb, we who behold him, main verb, God's in the grammar. Participle are being transformed. The effect of beholding is life change. You're not getting your life changed so you can behold him. The whole Christian life is about experiencing Jesus with the Bible, beholding him. He either cleans you up or he doesn't. If you think, what's that? He accepts you even though you're not clean. And that's exactly how we should end. God is a merciful God and a forgiving God. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter whether we sit here and read the Bible. That doesn't have anything to do with it. You've said it a number of times up here. Just I said that? Do. Jeepers, Wes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're here because we want to be here. We, we're all interested in reading the Bible. And why do we want to be well, here? I don't yeah. like. I mean, well, no, I don't like. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not interested. It doesn't turn me on. Yeah. I have certain places in the Bible, certain stories that really I like to You really like, like them. I like the Romans. You like Romans? They're my favorite stories, but... You, know, you like Leviticus? Huh? Do you like Leviticus? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I, I really don't. I don't know if I'll ever preach on Leviticus. That would be a real stretch for me. Yeah. yeah. And that one you had before that. I do, I the Song of Songs, songs. that was a of tough one for many people. Beyond all that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, my wife still hasn't forgiven me for Song of Songs. Yeah. Maybe you should talk to her. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. We need pastoral, we need counseling after that Song of Songs. Well, I mean, I'm just here to to hear you talk about the Bible because mm -hmm. you're very uh, intellectual. You've been, been everywhere. I fooled you, yes. Religion. Mm -hmm. I was interested in hearing what you had to say and maybe you'll say something that'll turn me on about why I should read some other parts Good. of the Bible. Good. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here. You, you'll keep me in line and straight. I'm not here to do that. No, no. <laughs> That's good. All right, y'all, we, we've gone over. So next week we're going to talk, we're going to look at round one. You pick any text. We're going to learn to listen to the text. What is that? What does that mean? We will explore that next week. Go in peace.